My larger purpose for us today is to trace back some of the origins of why COVID-19 outcomes are much worse among American, African Americans. We're gonna talk about how the US government at the behest of white voters created neighborhoods where people, primarily African Americans, live in concentrated poverty and are exposed to a cascade of adverse social determinants of health that lead to disease and early avoidable deaths. This is a topic we deal with in some detail in the School of Public Health and Health Professions micro-credential on strategies for eliminating health inequities. It's a space for learners from many backgrounds to come together and develop skills for reducing adverse social determinants of health that disproportionately affect marginalized communities. And I'll be saying a little bit about this program in case it's a topic you're interested in. I understand that a lot of times these talks are focused on research being conducted at UB, which is, um, and they're really amazing. Today, we'll highlight some of what we do in our teaching. I am guessing that many of you are rightfully skeptical about my title. Um, despite what it says, the COVID-19 disaster affecting Black people living in the US is, as I'm sure you know, four centuries in the making we can trace its beginnings back through decades of racist social policies, both, both in the North and South, Jim Crow era and to slavery. Now, since we don't have a semester together, I have chosen to focus our attention on the impact of the last century's government policies and practices that created and reinforced segregation in American cities and disinvestment in black communities, particularly in northern cities as six million African Americans migrated from the rural south to these urban centers between 1910 and the 1970s. These policies created spatially based adverse social determinants of health that give rise to chronic disease and have contributed to making black people living in the United States more vulnerable to COVID-19. So let's start in the early 1900s. As black communities grew in northern cities, whites sought to restrict where they could live. Racial zoning or city segregation ordinances were found unconstitutional in 1917. Um, of note, not because they limited options for black people, but because they limited property owners' rights. Racial zoning laws were replaced by restrictive covenants language written into the deed of a home prohibiting sales and rental properties to minorities. Developers, real estate agents, and neighborhood associations encouraged home buyers to sign these covenants. And eventually, the federal government would encourage and then require these restri restrictive covenants as well. There were also violent attacks by white mobs on individual African Americans in their, in their homes and um, then whole neighborhoods. In 1919, as black veterans were returning from serving in World War I in at least 25 cities, including Chicago, where this photograph was taken, white mobs attacked black people. And you know, feeling cheated out of their full citizenship that was their due after returning from World War I, the veterans and their communities resisted. And this laid the groundwork for the civil rights movement. In fact, this month is the anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa massacre, where whites, likely motivated by jealousy and a sense of threat to white supremacy, descended upon the Greenwood neighborhood, known as the Black Wall Street. Um, it was one of the wealthiest African-American communities in the country at the time. It was firebombed. Um, they burned 35 blocks, leaving most of its inhabitants homeless, about 10,000 people. Starting during the Great Depression, the Roosevelt administration made an indelible mark on American cities from which they haven't recovered. In an effort to end the financial collapse, the administration implemented what we all know of as the New Deal, um, a series of sweeping infrastructure and social programs. Um, while many of these programs had long lasting positive effects, the benefits were profoundly inequitable and deepened racial, economic, and social schisms in the United States. 
For example, as the Great Depression worsened, in 1933, the housing market collapsed and um, unemployed Americans were defaulting on their home payments uh, by estimate probably a quarter of the country's homeowners. Banks weren't lending and no one was building homes. The federal government started to provide mortgage relief and in 1934 created the Federal Housing Administration to make inexpensive government-backed mortgages available to home buyers, well, to white home buyers. The New Deal actually transformed home buying in this country, making it far more accessible than before for whites. Previously, people had made large down payments on short-term loans. The loans, these new loans, they were the reverse, small down payments and mortgages that borrowers could pay off over a long period of time. These mortgages were insured by the federal government, so they were were virtually no risk to the banks who then started to learn, lend again. The FHA, um, via the government owned Home Owners Loan Corporation, the HOLC, probably heard of this, also set the rules for who qualified for these loans. So these rules, as many of you are probably aware, is where the term redlining comes from. HOLC inspectors map US cities, classifying neighborhoods into gradients of financial risk. In actuality, these were really a proxy for whiteness. White neighborhoods were deemed low risk and eligible for loans, and other neighborhoods were not. Redlining refers to the fact that the high, quote unquote, high risk neighborhoods, typically minoritized neighborhoods, were colored in red and ineligible for federally backed loans. This meant white home buyers only bought in white neighborhoods and black buyers were crippled in their attempt to invest in home ownership because of course they were prevented from buying in white neighborhoods. Starting in 1937 and throughout the war, the federal government also built public housing. This was market rate housing embedded, um, this, this was market rate housing that was intended mostly for white working families. Um, when housing was built for others, the federal government ensured that whites and people of color were segregated into separate projects, such as the Willard Park public housing um, built on the east side of Buffalo, south of Broadway, which you've probably seen, it still stands today. There were many examples where this policy changed once integrated neighborhoods into segregated ones. After the war, the federal government became the major financial backer of suburban developments and inexpensive loans to whites buying these homes, either through FHA-backed mortgages or loans administered by the VA um, using GI Bill funds. One study showed that of 67,000 mortgages insured by the GI Bill in the New York City, New Jersey area, only 100 went to non-whites. After World War II, there was a mass movement of whites into the suburbs while people of color had no other choice but to remain in city neighborhoods. Perhaps none of these suburban developments is more famous in Levittown, which you see here, vast tracts of small Cape Cod homes built for returning war veterans. At one point, Levittown homes um, were built every 16 minutes. Developers such as William Levitt could only secure federal loans if they agreed to only sell to whites and place restrictive covenants um, in their deeds prohibiting the resale of homes to non-whites. Although Levitt claimed to not be prejudicial, he admitted that allowing his developments to be integrated would have scared white home buyers away. So while federal policies and practices probably had the most sweeping impact, state and local governments also used their own levers to keep black people segregated. And then white mobs and complicit law enforcement and real estate agents played roles as well. So the creation of white suburbs not only spatially organized society by race, it economically organized society by race. African Americans and other minoritized groups did not get to participate in what I venture um, it was the greatest entitlement program of the 20th century in the United States. Working class white families were able to buy single family homes at low interest rates with about 10% down. And then over half a century, see the value of their homes increase four or five times. This explains to a large extent the wealth gap um, between people of color and white people that we see today. Today, black families have 10 cents of wealth for every white family's dollar. 
And housing segregation was, of course, compounded by economic segregation. Most trade unions barred African Americans, as did many institutions of higher learning, making large sectors of the economy out of reach. Few returning Black veterans were able to use the education benefits promised them in the GI Bill. African Americans weren't only unable to get mortgages, they also didn't have access to capital to start and grow businesses. Black people living in the U.S. were geographically isolated, economically excluded, and then, of course, politically disenfranchised. We can ask ourselves, what kinds of neighborhoods did residential and economic segregation create? Housing in Black neighborhoods was paradoxically more expensive than in white suburbs because, well, there was a little competition um, for Black rent dollars. African Americans were not able to move out of a certain prescribed set of neighborhoods. Shortages meant that housing were, was more crowded than in white suburbs. And as whites moved out, the tax base eroded. The public and private sectors disinvested. Whites were moving, jobs relocated to the suburbs. And highways were prioritized over public transportation. In fact, insidiously, planners were encouraged to use highways um, such as the Kensington Expressway, you see here, to separate white and minoritized communi communities often contributing to the destruction of vibrant Black neighborhoods in the process, um, such as Hamlin Park. Infrastructure declined and schools were underfunded. And as we would expect, this meant that neighborhoods were less, uh, had less pleasant places for recreating, fewer grocery stores, landlords, landlords weren't taking care of their properties. Well, let's consider a little more closely how these um, policies impacted Buffalo. On the left is that familiar residential securities map from 1937. On the right is a figure where each green dot is an African-American person. Blue dots are white people and yellow dots represent Latinx and red Asians. The areas that were coded as low risk investments, green, blue, in the securities map, have continued to be white neighborhoods. And Black people and Latinx have been confined to yellow and red areas. Suburbs have remained white, with the exception of some relocation of communities of color to first ring suburbs, a common pattern uh, when city neighborhoods gentrify. Um, Buffalo is routinely ranked as one of the most segregated cities in the United States. However, this pattern is seen all over the United States. According to the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, 74% of neighborhoods that were designated as hazardous in residential securities maps are now low to moderate income neighborhoods and 64% remain communities of color. So why did segregation endure even after the Fair Housing Act of 1968 should have eliminated barriers to people for barriers, barriers for people of color to move into any neighborhood they chose. Um, so the Fair Housing Act, which passed in its third attempt, and probably because of the sentiment raised by Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination the week before, was intended to prevent discrimination against renters and buyers on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, familial status, and national origin. You know, watching Mitt Romney attend a Black Lives Matter protest over the weekend was interesting. As many of you probably know, Nixon's first housing secretary was Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, who, among other things, had introduced the first compact car to the United States as the CEO of Amer the American Motor Corporation, had been Michigan's governor during the Detroit riots of 67, and had demonstrated for housing desegregation. He also ran against Nixon for the Republican nomination of 68. He was one of the few politicians to embrace the Kerner Report, along with its recommendations, a subject we'll get to later. And he believed that his office should play a role in desegregating American cities. His plan was to use his HUD powers of the purse to quote unquote, convince cities to desegregate. Without informing Nixon of his strategy, he directed HUD to reject applications and support for infrastructure building, that is highways, sewer, et cetera, from states and cities that were not eliminating policies and practices that promoted segregation and reward them if they did. 
HUD became embroiled in lawsuits and Nixon started hearing from white politicians and he quickly shut the programs down. He was not willing to risk the white suburban vote and Romney would eventually be replaced. It actually isn't until 2015 under the Obama administration that there is any real progress at enforcing the Fair Housing Act's mandate to undo desegregation. Again, by conditioning HUD contracts on adequate performance on audits showing attempts to desegregate and to reduce poverty. Under Ben Carson, HUD, HUD is rolling back these rules as we speak. Without government action to undo its previous policies, desegregation was virtually impossible. Without benefiting from the massive government spending in housing and employment for the New Deal and the GI Bill, many Black Americans were priced out of the suburbs by the time they were no longer restricted from buying a home there. And then policies have continued to entrench the racial divide. For example, um, development projects benefiting from low income housing tax credits in Section 8 housing are more often than not placed in low-income neighborhoods. The pattern of economic disinvestment, and therefore poverty, follows the expected racial lines in Buffalo. Here, the darker the shading, the greater the proportion of households living in poverty. And you can see that the red line neighbors, neighborhoods, which were predominantly Black on the east side and Hispanic on the west side, have higher levels of poverty than the historically and currently white areas. In Buffalo, 37% of uh, black people live in poverty compared to 90% of 19% of white people. And black people are far more likely to live in neighborhoods with high poverty. And this is really important. So neighborhoods where there are 40% or more of households living in poverty. Uh, on a, it's about 79% for African-Americans versus 14% for whites. You see the contrast even more starkly for the proportion of households with children living in poverty. So this brings us to a fundamental public health truth. There is extensive documentation that neighborhood conditions influence health through what we call social determinants of health. Um, no doubt been dis discussed in, this, in your organizations. Housing quality, school quality, access to safe employment, whether neighborhoods are pleasant and safe, access to nutritious food and freedom from police intimidation, they're all examples of social determinants that may account for as much as 40% of people's health outcomes. If we consider their impact on health behaviors, physical activity, healthy, healthy eating, sleep quality, it turns out that social determinants account for most of our health. We can take our spatial analysis even further um, the racial makeup of Buffalo today closely mirrors the distribution of poverty. And from the next two slides, we can see it closely mirrors the distribution of disease. In this map, the darker colored neighborhoods have the highest rate of heart disease. Rates in African-American neighborhoods are as much as three times higher than in white neighborhoods, such as the, white, the Delaware Park area. The distribution of um, stroke prevalence looks much the same. And consider the important work by Thomas Leviste and colleagues, which shows that whites living in high poverty neighborhoods in Baltimore have health outcomes nearly as poor as Blacks in the same neighborhoods. And the purpose of this research was to provide evidence that Black-white health inequities are spatially, not genetically determined. There is ample evidence that Day in and day out, stressors of living in these neighborhoods and other forms of discrimination cause people of color to age prematurely. Arlene Geronimus at the University of Michigan coined this powerful metaphor, weathering, to capture the idea that the wear and tear of being in America, the, the, to capture this wear and tear of living in America on African Americans. So research indicates that black women and men accumulate greater allostatic load over time, which is just a fancy way of talking about the multi-organ system damage that tends to manifest itself in chronic disease, such as hypertension and diabetes and heart disease. And now we finally get to COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 has been described as a bellwether event or shining a light on health disparities or call to action. Here's some of what we know. In nearly all states where African-Americans um, 
make up at least 2% of the population. African Americans are disproportionately dying of COVID-19. So in some states, which you see in the bright orange, Michigan, Wisconsin, Missouri, Kansas, the proportion of deaths is more than three times the proportion of the population. Early results indicate that on average, black people in the United States are dying from COVID-19 at roughly twice the rate of white people. So we see in the dark green, the rate for African-Americans is about 55 per 100,000. And then in the dark blue, it's about 23 per 100,000 among whites. In Erie County, we interestingly don't see nearly this disproportionality. So about as of uh, May 28th, about 17% of those who died were African-American in a county that's 14.6% African-American. You know, colleagues and I have talked about this and speculated that the number um, reflect that so many Erie County deaths have occurred in nursing home patients. Uh, it's 47% as of May 17th. So, and most of these deaths have been in suburban um, nursing homes. The story actually changes when you take a look at the city of Buffalo. Buffalo is 37% African-American and the proportion of people who died of COVID-19 in Buffalo who are black as of May 28th was 48%. So an 11 percentage point difference. The difference isn't as large as can be seen in some cities and states, as you can see on the left-hand side of the figure, but it's similar to the national average, which is about a 12 percentage point difference. Now, undoubtedly, you've been hearing the explanations for why African-Americans are disproportionately dying from COVID-19. These have been widely publicized, which is a really good thing. We know that these, the disease manifestations of allostatic load or weathering, such as hypertension and heart disease, are contributing to serious COVID-19 disease. These diseases, which we know are linked to socioeconomic disadvantage, including that created by segregation and discrimination, are more common among African-Americans. We can recall that from our spatial analysis that we already looked at. And then here are a few statistics from Erie County. We see dramatic disparities in conditions associated with worse outcomes for COVID-19 based on hospital data from Erie County. Black people in Erie County are hospitalized for asthma at five times the rate of whites, are 50% more likely to be hospitalized for heart disease and two and a half times more likely to be hospitalized for diabetes. And these are just a few examples we typically find disparities in rates for all the comorbid diseases that seem to be making COVID-19 outcomes worse. And there have also been appalling and heartbreaking reports of Black people seeking care for which they suspect for what they suspect is COVID-19 and being turned turned away from testing centers urgent care in emergency rooms, and in some cases, dying in their homes. On top of interpersonal biases, which may lead providers to prioritize care for whites, there are systemic barriers. Laviste, who you'll recall did the research on effects of neighborhood on health disparities, raises the point that black people are overrepresented in Southern states that fail to expand Medicaid, and there are structural barriers such as only having drive-through testing and needing a primary care prescription for a COVID test that can disadvantage Black people. African Americans also appear to be getting COVID-19 at a disproportionate rate. Similar to the figure we saw previously showing disproportionate deaths, this figure shows that in most states, Black people are overrepresented among those testing positive for COVID-19 despite the real likelihood that they're finding it harder to get tested. So greater prevalence of COVID among African-Americans has been attributed to exposure due to working frontline jobs, including healthcare jobs, combined with greater use of public transportation, more crowded living circumstances. And each of these explanations can be traced back to a single fundamental cause, and that is systemic racism that has often been embodied in our segregated and disinvested neighborhoods where African Americans are more likely to live, as well as segregated and unequal health care, and then economic disenfranchisement, lack of opportunities for a wide spectrum of employment. <laughs>
how do we mitigate the COVID-19 disaster? Well, Buffalo may have avoided even worse disparities in COVID-19 deaths. In April, with advocacy from the Buffalo Center for Health Equity and others, $18 million, or $8 million of Medicaid funding, state Medicaid funding was set aside to increase outreach and testing on Buffalo's east side and west side, as well as wraparound support services uh, based on a network of community connections. And I would really be interested to hear what you have to say maybe in the chat box, but it appears that testing ac access seems to be fairly good in Buffalo now. Now, um, testing and contact tracing are obviously key for controlling the epidemic. And in communities of color, people doing the work should be from the community and they should be culturally and linguistically diverse. We need leaders from communities to build, help us build trust um, in order to promote this work. Communities with fewer financial resources need support so they don't have to make impossible choices between quarantining and staying afloat financially and our many frontline workers of color need PPE. Now, Louisville is also a really interesting example. It's put in place structures so that all disaster planning and response is done through an equity lens, which is something that I think we might aspire to here in Erie County. So there, the, the city's chief equity officer is part of the, the administrative lead of incident command structures for their emergency response team. They have a team of people working on gathering examples of best practices in other communities have engaged in what they call an equity audit to identify gaps in their response plan. So where communities of color may not be being treated equitably. As the city moves forward with reopening and the recovery process is being co-led by, co by the chief equity officer. So as one might imagine, as resources are being made available, available for the recovery, it's critical that these are used to make economic opportunity more equitable. Now, these are critical responses and they will help mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on black physical and economic lives. But the causes of inequity, along with a long list of disparities um, in other diseases are caused by social and economic conditions that won't change until we undo the damage of segregation and disinvestment that's been inflicted on neighborhoods of color. Over time, we expect that desegregation is likely to have positive effects on African Americans' health. There is a large body of research showing association between living in a segregated neighborhood and adverse health outcomes for Black people. So Black mothers living in segregated neighborhoods are more likely to have preterm births and lower birth weight babies than mothers living in more integrated neighborhoods. African-American cancer mortality is higher in segregated neighborhoods. And I could go on and on. A recent study showed that Black people who, as they grew up, if they moved into more integrated neighborhoods, had lower blood pressure than those who remained in segregated neighborhoods. Greater Now, we have to think about this in a complex way, though. Greater exposure to interpersonal racism is quite probable in the short term um, as African-Americans move into white neighborhoods or vice versa. The results of a large scale experiment where families were moved out of a high to low poverty neighborhoods suggest that young black men were adversely affected, but overall health, the health, education and income trajectories were better when families moved. So we shouldn't by, be naive. The situations are complex and they run the spectrum from strengthening existing communities of color to incentivizing integration. I suspect that I'm not alone in having been reflecting on another summer, the long hot summer of 1967. So 159 protests and uprisings filled American streets with protesters and famously National Guardsmen that summer. Then as in now, um, white Americans faced a choice between supporting reform or doubling down on law and order conflating looters and protesters, attributing the epidemic of unjust policing practices to bad apples. So the choice faced now, then as in now, is whether white people are able to give up the financial, the political, the ego benefits of white supremacy. Now, 1968 is viewed by historians as a missed opportunity 
There was a failed attempt to understand and solve the structural race inequalities in America. President Lyndon Johnson established a commission to understand the causes of the 1967 protests that became so destructive in Detroit and Newark and other American cities. The report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, or the Kerner Report, as it became to be known after the chairman of the commission, was released February of 1968. It put the responsibility for the 67 protests squarely at the feet of white racism. To quote from the report, white racism is essentially responsible for the explosive mixture which has been accumulating in our cities since the end of World War II. According to the report, the concerns of the protesters rightfully included unfair police practices and brutality, unemployment, inadequate housing, education, and recreational facilities, ineffective political structure, structures, interpersonal racism, discrimination in the justice, justice system, banking system, and inadequate government programs. The same list is talked about today. All re realities abetted by state executed or state san sanctioned efforts to keep African Americans isolated in ghettos. As a side note, the Kerner report has also an additional relevance today. The report underscored how excessive responses to peaceful protests set against a backdrop of years of institutions flaunting US laws by violently, violently aggressing against nonviolent protesters were typically the instigating factors in riots. The Kerner report recommended massive investment in inner cities, such as the creation of 2 million jobs in three years, as well as policy changes to promote desegregation. It acknowledged and recommended increases in taxes to, to fund the investment. So Lyndon Johnson, upon receiving the Kerner report, was not ready for its message and failed to endorse the report. It countered his beliefs that communists and journalists had fanned the flames of the riots, and its message was that he hadn't done enough to improve civil rights for African Americans. Despite the passing of the Fair Housing Act later that year, we see a marked decrease in support for civil right, the civil rights movement among middle-class whites, which would be confirmed in their endorsement of Nixon's law and order campaign for the White House later that year. So the summer of 2020, Millions of African Americans, about 80,000 a year, have lost their lives to a system of white supremacy that continues to profit off of black bodies. The gap you see here in life expectancy represents someone's grandparent who died four years younger than they would have if they were white. It's Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and George Floyd people who had family and friends who loved them. It's Eric, Erica Garner, who very well might have died of the stress from her father's murder. I hope this is not our 1968. Um, I kind of take off my professor hat here. I'm actually hopeful that it isn't. A lot has already, really, already been accomplished by the protesters, but as we see, there are many more racist systems that need to be dismantled. I hope that this isn't our 1968 because white voters, if they'd held different views then, American cities might very well have looked quite different today and quite probably millions of lives would have been saved. So if you're interested in reading more about segregation and about the sources I've been drawing on, um, one source is this really landmark book by Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law. The Partnership for the Public Good in Open Buffalo recently issued a report on the history of segregation in Buffalo, which you can find on, online, and it's very interesting. Now, urban segregation is not the whole story here. It's only part. Last year, there was an absolutely excellent article in The Atlantic on how government policies on local racist practices abetted a massive theft of farmland from Black people living in the South during the same periods we discussed today. And if you're interested in joining us, um, I want to tell you a little bit about our micro-credential. So in order to undo systemic racism, all of us can apply an equity lens in our work. Our motivation for creating 
this micro-credential and strategies for eliminating health inequities was to come together with people working in both the not-for-profit and the for-profit sectors and to learn to see systemic and interpersonal discrimination and then to develop tools for undoing this discrimination. And although we have a focus on understanding social determinants and healthcare systems, um, we really welcome learners from across a much broader range of uh, sectors. The micro-credential consists of a two-course se sequence. It can be done online or a combination of online and seated. And you know, we welcome everyone who has a college degree. It's graduate level work. Um, the folks we you know, aimed this, sort of created this for was people working in not-for-profits engaged with marginalized communities, people working in the healthcare system who want to understand how social determinants influence patient outcomes and want to align the work of their organizations to change adverse social determinants. And then people working in the for-profit sector who want to work towards an equitable economy. And you'll be joined by UB graduate students who want to incorporate equity work in their careers. So our goal was that it would help folks become equity leaders in their organizations, center the concerns of marginalized communities in organizations and help systems understand change, um, sort of understand systems change for improving social determinants of health. Um, so I'm just gonna close with a way to get in touch. Um, you know, if you want more information or interested in this micro-credential, please reach out to me. Now, I also would love to get in touch with folks who are interested in working on diversifying the public health and health professions workforce in Western New York. This is something we're very committed to in the School of Public Health and Health Professions. And if you share these, the same goal, I would very much like to sit down and we could talk about these efforts.